Tēnā koutou katoa, ngami nui ke koutou ki tēne hui e me te kaupapa o tēne wā creating inclusive learning sessions and sensory maths. Welcome back after our Easter break and welcome to this webinar. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Monica Kuhn and I'm one of the learning specialists on the project team for Te Puti Akimana Tanga and I look forward to us all learning together for the next hour. Now before we get started, let's um, say karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki mā tāra tāra ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, he tiu, he hoka, he hauhu, ti hei Māori ora. Great. Before we get started, um, I just want to remind you all that this webinar is recorded as usual and it will be uploaded to YouTube with participants' faces blurred out and shared then on our website. This will allow you and anyone who couldn't make it today to come and back and re-watch the session. We will also upload any relevant links to our website. Now, as usual, please use the chat to um, ask questions, which we will pose to the presenters towards the end of the session. Let me introduce our speakers for today. Muriel uh, McLeon is our first speaker here on the left, and she's just recently moved back to Christchurch after living in Auckland. During her time as an educator at Tamaki Paenga here at Auckland War Memorial Museum, she became passionate about creating inclusive spaces and learning experiences. As part of the museum's diversity and inclusion working group, she helped develop inclusive education initiatives across the museum, including social scripts, sensory maps, and quiet hour events. And on the right, we've got Tom Rowlands. As a learning specialist at Tamaki Paenga here at Auckland War Memorial Museum, Tom develops and delivers learning experiences to Akonga across Tamaki Makaura, and his portfolio covers many science-based topics like volcanoes, dinosaurs, entomology, and citizen science. In addition to his programs, Tom helped the museum in its efforts to obtain the Rainbow Tick, and he is in the diversity and inclusion working group for the wider organization. That's all left to say, and I hand it over to Tom and Muriel now. Kia ora. Kia ora, everybody. Um, I will share my screen. Spoiler alert. All right, well, thank you so much for the introduction, Monica. Um, it's nice to have everybody here. I can't see anybody because I'm sharing my screen on Meet and I can only see um, what's on my screen right now. So um, that's me, I'll hide this little thing. Um, so I'll begin by talking about the museum as a whole and the museum's journey to, to be as inclusive as possible within the last um, 10 or so years. And it's certainly ramped up over the last five years as well. Um, and then we're going to talk a bit about how the learning team has been involved with, um, with this journey as well. And we'll go through some of the examples that Muriel and I um, have been through together. Just letting you know we're not, um, we're not experts in this field. We're, uh, we're along for the journey. And I guess the title learning specialist means we're learning as much as we can um, along the way as well. So um, I'll begin by talking about uh, the museum's uh, mindsets and behavior, which is uh, Hewaka Ekenoa. So whenever, um, whenever a project is started at the museum, we need to abide by three different policies, um, three different policies and frameworks and strategies when we're thinking about projects, um, which includes our learning programs as well. We've got um, He Karahi Māori, which is our uh, Mātauranga Māori framework and strategy. So whenever, uh, so everything that we do needs to weave in strands of Mātauranga Māori. Um, and similarly with Tuleva, which is our Pacific um, strategy, Pacific dimensions need to be added to our programs as well. And finally, um, our newer policy, which is the inclusion and diversity policy, which came about in 2018 means everything we do now needs to have, uh, needs to include inclusion and diversity too. So since we've created our policy, 
Um, we did this in order to get the rainbow tick uh, back in 2018. So we've, uh, we've defined what an inclusive museum and what that means for us. So I can, uh, I'll read this out for you all. Uh, a truly creative organization where the diverse communities of Tamaki and Makoto are engaged and employed, where they experience manakitanga, respect and connection, where their voices are heard and their stories are told. So I took a, a screen grab of our, um, of our annual, uh, our, our last year's review of uh, some of the projects that we have developed in the last year. Um, I'm not gonna read them all out to you. You can see them there. You can also see them online. Um, so that was just one year's worth of work. Um, but for the last five years, Muriel will talk about um, some of the other projects that we've been involved with as well. Just letting you know that this is uh, the efforts of the museum as a whole. There's no specific team um, to deliver these projects. So I'll pass it over to Mur Muriel, who will talk about these projects. Kia ora koutou katoa, ko Muriel tōku uh, So it's my privilege today to talk you through some of the things that I got up to at Auckland Museum. Um, and like Tom mentions, it's as teams and within the whole museum that we're doing these activities. Uh, so one of the things that we really love to do and enjoy doing and will conti they'll continue to do it at Auckland Museum uh, are the quiet hours. Uh, so this is a photo of a quiet hour on the screen from the Lego event. So it wasn't our first quiet hour that was run but it was one where we had a bit of knowledge about how to run a quiet hour because we'd done it a few times in the past. So with the quiet hours, first and foremost, there are less people that are coming to the quiet hour. And so it's important that the whole museum is on, on board and wants to be inclusive uh, because with Lego, there's ticket prices. So to have a smaller group of people through means there would not as, be as much money. So to have everyone on board means that it's just a no-brainer. Yes, we're going to do a quiet hour. Then going through with the AV team, make sure that we don't have background noises because this can cause a lot of sensitivity for people who are on the autism spectrum, which is the target audience of a quiet hour, although not the only audience for a quiet hour. There are people who just want to come um, aside from that as well. And then we're also thinking about lighting in a quiet hour as well and just making sure there's not bright and irritating lights um, that are going on. So doing a walkthrough with the team and checking out what it's like and getting the whole team on board. So the visitor hosts at Auckland Museum, Tamaki Pangihira, they are on board as well and they have a bit of training before the event starts. They also suggest things like uh, ticket scanners and turning off the beep of ticket scanners. And then after the event, and this is where a lot of the learning comes from, the VMR team has been wonderful and done some reviews for us of the people that have attended events like this. And so we were able to work out that we were hosting quiet hours at times that we thought were really good for us in the afternoon when it's naturally a bit quieter. But for families with children on the autism spectrum, they were preferring a morning slot. So we're able to shift times yeah so that feedback is a way of learning and it's really very worthwhile doing these things and having these events this lego quiet hour that i was at was quite amazing i made a connection with a small child there and afterwards her mother said this was the best thing that she had ever been to and that was full stop <laughs> so that was coming and being able to enjoy her passion of lego in a way where they didn't they didn't have to leave the event to go to their car to have a break when she got overwhelmed we'd set up a quiet space which is really important for a quiet hour having a space where you can go and you can just sit down when you're a bit overwhelmed you can have a drink you can have some food which i know can be difficult in museums to find <laughs> find or galleries to find that space but if they know that that space is there it can really add to the visit. They know there's somewhere you can retreat to and then go back in. Yeah, so that's one of the things um, that we did and our team was involved in and other teams as well. 
Also for general visitors and school groups, having social scripts for people who have autism are really helpful. So social scripts are little stories that prepare you for what you're about to do. And they're written in first person, they have lots of pictures and they introduce you to where you are. So they'll show you where you are at the museum, the outside of it, so you know where you're going into. And then they'll give you just little instructions of what might happen. So this one that you can see on the screen is one for our school group. So it's talking about, I will put my bag away. It's talking about who you'll meet. So you can see one of the visitor hosts at the time, Katie there, and she's talking to them. The way that we did this one was with the help of Autism New Zealand and also uh, with a mother and son, um, and the son was on the autism spectrum and he was able to give us great advice. She was able to give us great advice as well, because of course, everyone who has autism is different, but they were able to talk to their needs and other people, people's needs as well. Because you want something like this to be adjustable. So, if we... so you can see here is a page and it says that choose your own interests or triggers. So to one person, say a shark might be really frightening and something they have to plan to go and see. To another person, that shark might be the most exciting part of the journey and that's what they're planning towards. Because of course, as Tom keeps telling you, we're not the experts, but we're learning from everyone around us. And it's really those parents and teachers who know their students and children best so the more flexibility that they can have to make their own stories, the better. But if we're giving them that template, it's provided really helpful to our visitors. And along the same line, so still thinking about autism and neurodiverse, some people who have autism have uh, a very highly sensitive to certain things. And so creating a sensory map can just be another tool that helps in planning for a visit. And you'll see on this map that needs to be reworked because museums, galleries, always changing. Um, it has pink and the pink is indi indicating those high activity areas, so high sensory. And you can see the top photo that's of a weird and wonderful gallery. And in the Weird and Wonderful Children's Discovery Gallery, there is a lot going on. There is multimedia, there are different soundscapes, and it's not that someone should avoid that space, but they might just need to be prepared and know what it means to go into that space. Does it mean that they're gonna have their headphones? Does it mean that they need to know where the quiet space is next to the space? So it's not about stopping anyone enjoying any part of the museum, but just that, preparation for going into it. And to make this map, we um, listened to advice and then we went around the galleries with a map and our highlighters and uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty DIY. Um, and we're looking around to see, at the time of the first map, we're looking around to see seating as well, uh, see everything that could be a good rest stop. But as the museum has tried to become more and more inclusive, there's actually seating everywhere. So the map will change as Tamaki Pangaheira changes, as Auckland Museum changes. Yeah, so it's, it's on its refresh, isn't it, Tom? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you can see a quieter space below. So less foot traffic. There's no background noise in, in that gallery, which is Arts of Asia. And you might see this list from <laughs> and think, whoa, but this, uh, this is the whole museum. So once again, it's not just one team working on it. So the accessibility virtual tour is the digital team. And it's another way for people to prepare for their visit, which is helpful for schools as well. We can give them that link and they can walk through where they're going, which is next level to, um, yeah, next level to a map that you might provide them, you can go into the different spaces. We have more mobility parks now, 
Uh, we also have wheelchair ramps in some of our heritage spaces where we didn't before, so up in the sanctuary. Uh, and to continue in our practice and keep getting better in our practice, we have been lucky enough to have different trainings. Um, so one of the trainings was with Nicola Owen from Audio Described Aotearoa, and that was amazing and I then can take that into my work with blind and low vision students and we've also had a lecture series that was from different experts on diversity and inclusion so we can we eat up all this good stuff and um, we've been captioning images uh, there was a project with Auckland University and also with Alzheimer's Auckland to create tours for uh, people with Alzheimer's and dementia to come with their carers. It wasn't a respite tour, it was a tour for just enjoying your day, but knowing you've got a place to retreat, knowing there are certain things that are familiar to you. We have new toilets, um, so gender neutral toilets, but they're not at the heritage end of our building, uh, so they're at, at the other end. So it's not, <laughs> yeah, it would be lovely if they were everywhere. But there's always constraints, as I'm sure you will all know. Um, there's a new public bus route to the museum, so you can get up to uh, Tamaki Pangahera on the bus. And like I mentioned, the lecture series was is always great to keep learning. And plan your visit online, rainbow tick, and complimentary complimentary tickets for paid assistance is for the um, in general, but for the quiet hours as well. Kia ora, Mario. All right, I'll talk about the learning team and, and what we do to, um, to be as inclusive as possible within our learning programs. And I'm gonna start with, um, you see the numbers one to six. Those are the museum's five main goals from the last five years. So it's our five year plan. And there's um, one of them that sticks out to me like a sore thumb, which is engage every school child. And at the time when we when we got this, um, it was quite daunting. And I remember Googling how many school children are there in the world? Oh, there's two billion, um, which was very ambitious. And we're like, all right, let's let's do it. Um, <clears throat> but during the last five years, we have uh, redefined what engaging every school child means um, to get away from two billion. Uh, it's for us, it's having the ability to engage every school child with different learning needs. And so, with, in the last few years, um, we have broadened our resources and our ability to uh, to create programs for learners of all kinds. So, I'll talk to you through um, what we do day to day. Um, and then after that, we'll go through a couple of examples that Muriel and I have um, done together. So in our learning programs, we aim to ignite curiosity. So whether that be through small tidbits of information, we want our children to leave the museum with more questions than what they had coming in. And so it's not just about blah, blah, blah to kids, just speaking to them. We want them to engage with our handling collection so we do have an extensive handling collection with thousands of items and we're very privileged to have this. Um, it's a point of difference for, for teachers that want to come to the museum because they want their students and their akonga to have a uh, handling experience with taonga. Um, taonga they've nev they'll never be able to handle ever. Um, so that is great sensory learning for us and we're very privileged to have, to have that as a different learning type. Um, we've been teaching in schools a lot more over the last few years. Um, in fact, most of my teaching, over well over 50% of my teaching is delivered in schools. Um, although it means I have to wake up earlier every day, um, it's a lot easier for schools for me to go to their school than for them to bring 120 kids into the museum. Um, a lot of the times it's free as well, so free for uh, parents. So many schools, even if, even if the program is paid, uh, we charge $5 for a lot of our programs, um, the school can 
most of the time cover the cost of that um, rather than paying for the bus. Um, <clears throat> a lot of our programs are deliverable in Te Reo Māori. We're, we're growing our capacity in this area. Um, there's still a long way to go, but more and more of our programs are being translated, and that means Kura Kaupapa um, can also be included in our mainstream programs as well. We aim to use the universal design for learning in all of our programs. I remember when I first started, I was quite um, enthusiastic about colour and um, a lot of uh, sensory objects all at once. But I've definitely refined my process over this time, thinking about the universal design for learning. Is this too much for a student? Is my text big enough for every student to read? Is the lighting appropriate? So it's about thinking about everybody and how, when they walk into a space, is it comfortable? Can they read everything? Can they, um, are, yeah, are they comfortable? And then lastly, we're very open as a team um, to collaborate with knowledge holders. So these are people that, um, <clears throat> that work with learners at Apanga with different needs. And as we, we keep saying, we're not the experts. We love to learn from the teachers. We love to learn from the students as well. So we're very open to, to hearing from them. And I'm sure you all are as well. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of nodding heads out there, but I can't see you. Wonderful. So with our standard practice before students are coming in, uh, we make sure that we're sending out an email um, to every teacher and finding out about those students. So we want to know how we can best help the students that are coming in on the day, what needs they have, whether there are uh, specific disabilities that we can assist with or make sure we're finding the right route in, making sure we're delivering in an appropriate manner. And then we also are sending out at that time a video. And this video here is a video which covers the rules. Um, so it's an orientation video, but it, <laughs> we started it with the idea of, oh, we'd love the students to know what's appropriate behavior before they come in. But it ended up being something more fun than that something that the students can see what's inside the museum beforehand. They get the vibe of it being really fun and friendly and they're able to identify us. You might think, oh, but you no longer work there and you're in the video. It doesn't seem to matter too much. Students seem to think any woman is me, the video lady, uh, and Aaron is in the video, but Tom also is of course uh, called the video man. So it's just a nice relationship builder with the classes before they arrive, which means they feel they know a bit more about us and can share a bit more and be a bit more of themselves at the museum. Okay, I didn't just put a, a picture of Muriel and I up here because we look amazing. Um, it does have a purpose with this example. Um, we'll be talking about two different examples, one um, with a group with autism and another group um, from Blends the Blind and the Blind Foundation. Um, so Muriel and I got this email uh, a couple of weeks before this group was due to come in. Uh, there were about 15 uh, boys, they were all boys with uh, autism. And so we, we got into action and uh, firstly, contacted the teacher. I'm sure we all do that before they come into the museum and we ask, what needs do you have? Um, <clears throat> so we really took the advice from this particular teacher who was just amazing. Um, we generate, as a, the second point is, is we, this, this will be our only group in the day. So we, we like to take our time um, with these akonga. And although our, our programs are only an hour long, sometimes it goes over way more than that. Um, we provided our social script and sensory map uh, prior to their visit and then we let the students be familiar with us not just with our video but we also sent this uh, picture of Muriel and I um, so they know who to look for when they come in. We also decided to wear the same clothes um, just as an extra precaution which was quite 
it was quite fun. Uh, we had such a good time with the with these with these students. We were doing volcanoes, which is such a a, a popular subject anyway. Um, and then we heard that one of the boys was just obsessed with T Rex. Um, so we brought out some of our um, T Rex um, handling Tonga, and they just had the best day of their lives. That's what I like to think anyway. Um, so some groups of students that we often work with are blind and low vision education network students. Um, and so we get different groups coming in. They may be at school altogether or they might uh, be in different groups across the city and then join together for a special excursion into the museum. And the group that I'm going to talk about is a group that is from all over the country and they're getting ready to live independently. So they've just finished school and they came to Auckland Museum as part of their getting ready to live independently. And they didn't just come to Auckland Museum once, they came multiple times, which was really wonderful because we got to know them a bit better. But when they first came, I used the knowledge that I, I had from previous classes and trainings to think, okay, well, low, low vision, I'll make sure that anything we have in the Volcanoes program that we would have in writing is available, not laminated, so it's not gonna shine and distract, and that it is clear, large print that can be held up um, closely to them. I know there's gonna be a seminar later all, of, all about this kind of stuff, so I won't go too far into it because as we keep saying, I'm not the expert, but I love learning about all of this. And we had the group in, but two of the group uh, were not low vision, they were blind. And so I hadn't managed to get hold of the teacher beforehand, but at that point she said, oh, I like what you've done here, but really if you had have sent us a document in advance with all the writing, we can get the Blind Foundation to print it in Braille. So we constantly learning from those teachers that are coming in, from those students that are coming in as well, especially with the older group, they were adults, they could tell us a lot about what they liked and what they didn't like. And what they mainly liked was feeling the rocks and this the specific weight of the rocks and really being able to touch, touch that. Um, as part of it as well, we thought, well, this is an older group, maybe they've got other interests because we knew they were just booking volcanoes to have that experience and get used to the museum. Uh, so we had bird sounds and feathers of different birds that are around and it led to some really great chats. Like Tom said, if you can allow more time after a group comes in, you get to go off on different tangents and have those wonderful rich conversations with people and get to know them. And through those rich conversations, uh, we learned that one of them speak, uh, speaks for Te Reo Māori and he was then able to go into a separate group that in a week's time with one of our Te Reo Māori educators, which, which was really cool because then I could share that information on with, with that educator and we get to know the students better over time. Yeah, so just learn so much through getting to know students as teachers, and as I'm sure you're all well aware of all those relationships are just so valuable. Um, so as I said, our journey is ever continuous, um, but along this journey, we've learned heaps. We've learned so much about being as inclusive as possible. Um, so I'll share some of those learnings with you. Um, so, the first one is uh, kind of a no-brainer to me. <laughs> so being aware of learning abilities before uh, before the learners come to your session is always uh, important for me anyway. As long as I'm prepared, then everybody is going to um, have a great learning session with us. Um, following advice from teachers, they are the real knowledge holders of their students. Um, the third point there says best to make no assumptions. So I put the I put a example as being as gender neutral as possible. 
I make sure that when we do have new um, kaiapo joining us that you know we remove gender bias we remove um, other biases as well just to be as neutral as possible um, the next point is well, it's thanks to these policies that the museum has developed and it really has been um, it really has come from above um, to make us not make us feel comfortable but the museum does make me feel comfortable being myself in the museum so that makes for more meaningful connections when i can be myself when i'm delivering programs um, listen to feedback yes and then there's always something new around the corner um, every day for me in the museum is different even if i'm teaching the same subject over and over again um, every class is a different personality and every student is different so i make sure i learn as much as i can from all of the akonga that I engage with. I know that we, 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 we talked a lot, we talked about a lot in such a short amount of time. So if you did want to get in, in contact with me, I am on our um, diversity and inclusion uh, group. So if you wanted to learn more about how to develop some of these uh, some of these initiatives, then you are most welcome to contact me and I can get you in touch with either the right person or we can discuss the process together. And a lot of what we've talked, talked about today has also been in collaboration with groups like Arts Access, Aotearoa and the Blind, Blind Foundation. So yeah, there's, there's lots of good places out there for connecting to if you want to continue on this kaupapa yourself. All right, kia ora. I'm going to stop sharing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom and Muriel. There, there was a whirlwind tour through something that has um, no doubt taken you a long time to acquire. You're still working on it. Um, and there will be a lot of us sitting here going like, oh, you know, I want to adopt this, I want to adopt that. So um, this is the time now for everybody in the audience to ask some of the questions. Keep in mind, Tom and Muriel have said more than once, they're not the experts, but they've got um, a lot of experience in this field that uh, some of us might not have. So if you've got any questions, um, you could either um, go and drop them in the chat, or you can use the raise your hand button down the bottom and we'll um, call people um, and um, ask them to unmute themselves and ask those questions. There's a couple of questions there for you guys already, if that's all right with you. Um, first one here is, it's actually one from Helen. And I know she always has great questions. She thinks um, about um, how, how that applies um, in, in the different contexts. And she's asking here, who wrote your access and inclusion policy? Um, I don't know who of you wants to answer that. <laughs> Um, it was led by our executive member who is in charge of our people and organization department. Mm -hmm. So she led it and I'm not a hundred percent sure of the workings of how that got created. Mm. Yeah. So um, just to follow on on that question, I assume um, there was an interest across the organization. Did your organization start with the policies and then put things in place or was it a grassroots thing or, we, or a mixture? Yeah, policy? we started with um, wanting to get the rainbow tick mm. and then going through the process of getting that and you needed to have a policy in order to have a rainbow tick. Oh, okay, so the, the yeah. policy developed out of that work. Yeah, it was like a really big checklist. Fantastic. But it at the same time, there was a diversity and inclusion working group that started from staff interest. So it came from yeah multiple strands, and the other the other policies were already existing. Hey, Māori and Tiolava, yeah. and then they married in together. There's some questions, further questions about your policy here. Um, do you know? Is that on the website? Is that publicly available for yeah. us to look at? It's on the website. If you you can just Google Auckland Museum Diversity and Inclusion Policy, and it will be one of the first ones popped up popping up. I've done it before. Fantastic. So, um, if anybody has trouble with that, Mel is usually with 
I can see her typing away. She's probably Googling for it as we speak. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, there's a question from Linda's. Hi, Linda's, just down the road from me. Um, she's just asking as a visitor, not part of a group, are these guides that you've uh, developed available for me to just pick up when I arrive? Um, for example, the, um, the low stimulus one, I think you mean um, the sensory map? Yeah, so the sensory map is available on the website. Um, so it's about preparing for your visit. So it'd be before you came in. Mm -hmm. But we, if you were coming to a quiet hour, we might have some of those materials already printed out available for you. So yeah, it's not just for school groups, it's for, for everyone. Great, so you could pick that up. If, if you um, arrive and realize, oh, busy place might be too busy for me to cope with, there is a guide that I can help my um, plan my journey on the day then, if need be. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I've actually got a question about quiet hours, sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in there briefly. Mm -hmm. um, do you have some tips on how to organize a successful quiet hour of an exhibition? Where does one start? Oh, starting with an exhibition that you think children would want to see, I would say is a, is a great start and then getting in touch with Autism New Zealand to advertise it through their networks. Uh, apart from that, it's really the practical, mm. practical side of it, getting in touch with your AV team and seeing what's adjustable in the space, what's not adjustable and signposts. If you can't, if you can't change the soundscape, what could you do about it? Mm. And the setting up of that little quiet space is really important. So where in your gallery or museum could you have a place where there can be some water and they can have their own food and drink? ideally with a bit of natural light but we we didn't often manage to achieve the natural light one yeah and we all know as educators how difficult it is to negotiate those spaces for having kai um in our museum buildings when there's also tanga present so um i'm sure there will be lots of um people in the audience thinking about that right now uh, how to um make this happen that that's really helpful thank you so much um and, i yeah oh just at the museum if if we couldn't have food available there, it's just what can you do that's the next best thing? Because we all know we're working in these environments that you just have to make work and yeah. how can you make them work? Yeah. Um, there is a number of other questions that I've just uh, finding in the chat. So let me just have a quick skim read. Um, and if anybody would really like um, to ask a question, take the mic, please feel free to um, raise, use the raise the hand button. Um, Helen is asking about the handling collection. Um, what sorts of things do you have in your handling collection? And can you give an example of an activity of how you use them, please? Yeah, um, all sorts. So we've got so many things in our handling collection, ranging from natural science specimens to, uh, to Māori Tonga, to the Pacific Tonga as well, to um, history, colonial, lots of stuff it's pretty hard for me to fathom or to list everything that we have um uh and an example of an activity of how you use them um uh, we've used them in the past as uh, a way to unpack information about a specific tonga or a specific theme um choosing your own direction of learning as well so if you have a, a table set up with all marine animals for example then they can select which one they, uh, they're drawn to the most. Um, we've started to, we've a new product is a Kete Wananga product. So we've curated um, kits, boxes, pelican cases of, um, of Tonga, of natural science Tonga. So there's, um, there's marine themed, there's freshwater themed and Te Wānui forest themed. And schools can hire these specimens bring them into their school and use them for a term. So it is really about um, using your senses to unpack as much as you can, starting with touch. Great. Um, Helen, just as asking a question, what I wanted to ask, where did you source your handling objects? Are they bought or made for you? I was thinking, you know, are they real objects specially set aside for that real mm -hmm. in the sense of an historic item or um, are they like a replica to stand in for that? Yeah, it's a it's a, a mixture. So a lot of them have been ex-display specimens. 
So specimens, they don't have a lot of information attached to them. Um, information, uh, other Taonga are, um, our curators get handed a lot of um, artifacts and objects every day. And a lot of the times it's, I don't have a lot of information to, to, access, uh, to accession these. And so they'll often give them to the education team. Um, and yeah, we do make, in the past we've definitely made a lot and uh, most recently bought as well. So we've bought a lot of uh, dinosaur objects from overseas as well for our dinosaur programs. Great. Uh, did you have to consider anything in particular with COVID restrictions about um, handling of objects? Yeah, some, some, some objects you can clean, but some you just can't. So um, when students enter our learning spaces, we sanitize and then we sanitize on the way out again. That's the best we can do. And then it's either, it's either also asking the teachers, is this okay? <laughs> if it's not okay, then we just follow their direction. Yeah, go with the teacher's direction yeah. is, is probably a safe bet. Um, is there anybody else who's got questions? Sorry, I could be, I could be monopolizing this conversation for the, um, the next hour um, because I've got so many questions of my own, but I'm sure there's other people who would like to ask a question. Um, but please be um, assured that if you can think of your question later after the webinar, and you want it directed to Tom or Muriel. Um, if you haven't grabbed Tom's email address, you can always direct it to Mel and we'll pass on those questions. So there might be a few more questions coming your way <laughs> afterwards. Um, now you have gone through a lot of training um, over time. You've learned so much. Is there any particular training that you can really um, that you can really recommend? Something where you go like, that is something everybody should be doing. Um, each training has just opened my eyes to different different ways that we can plan and prepare for visitors. I find the training that's most helpful is when um, there is someone delivering. So I went to the Museums of Inclusion um, Autism Friendly Museums Workshop and they had people there who have autism and talked us through their experiences of life and they were also different to each other but they gave you a good sense of what it what people how people might be visiting the museum and what might be triggering them and it won't always you don't know from that you can't um, be that person but you can just be more aware of of what might be a trigger and the same with the audio described Aotearoa um, we we learned a lot about fro directly from uh, someone who was who is blind and his experience. It's just really great to hear firsthand some of the experiences and then put that together with your knowledge of the institution that you're working in to go, how could I make this visit more pleasurable and enjoyable for yeah. this person? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really good reminder for all of us. It's the, the slogan has been around for a while, but it's so true, nothing about us without us. And that's really key um, as you have identified for the training that you found. Really now, Elaine from Waikato has just got a question here. Um, would using white gloves, collection team gloves, be able to get around COVID if they were rushed after each group? Um, of our COVID issues if they were washed after each group and teach good handling practice. Um, it's re a really good question because we're talking about COVID, but we're also talking about the fact that people see items with their hands. Have you got any opinions on that, either of you? We used to deliver programs that with, we make them wear gloves. Um, I think it, at the time it just required a lot of washing. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe someone else here can also answer that question. Um, we don't have the nitrile gloves for students to use, otherwise it would be such a huge waste of gloves. Um, but yeah, we, we used to have to wash the gloves after every day if we were to do that. Yeah, and um, from my own experience, I can add to this, don't wash them warm because they shrink. 
I, <laughs> I have a, um, a, a, the education team at Waitangi have a whole set of very small gloves in their, <laughs> in their assorted resources um, because I have washed them a bit too warm. <laughs> Now, um, Mel has been sharing a few more resources in the background. And as Mel said in the chat earlier, um, all the resources we're going to share again um, when the recording goes live. Um, so there will be some uh, questions that can possibly come out of there. But we've got here links to kidsinmuseums.org.uk, Smithsonian, uh, Museum Next articles, Autism um, UK. So there's lots and lots of resources out there. Um, you know, when people look at these resources now, Tom and Muriel, and they go like, I want to make a start, where do you reckon is the best place to get started? Sorry, is this from um, is this from Helen's question earlier? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard because, you know, when you have a program and you think it in your head, you write it down on, on paper, and then you think it's a perfect product, and then you go and do it and you realize oh, there's so much I have to change. Um, we're going through that process right now with the new program. So um, a lot of it is on the job, like you're, you're learning as you're going and as you're delivering. And often your first, the first time you're delivering it is satisfactory and the, and the teacher, you know, you get good reviews, but in your head, you're like, oh, I can do this so much better. So it might be about getting specific feedback from the teacher um was was this inclusive enough or can you give me any further suggestions with how that that could be better in terms of um diversity and inclusion i don't know do you, do you want to add anything muriel sure when uh, thinking sort of more specifically about how our work um started with sensory maps um i know some of you know wendy and wendy had lots of uh, a former colleague she had lots of experience from teaching uh, that she wanted then to be incorporated into the museum and the accessibility. So it's sort of forming, a, for me, I work best in a team. So drawing on the strengths of others and working out what you think is important, but then also talking wider to groups like Arts Access Aotearoa and Autism New Zealand. So it's a mixture of in, internal drive and knowing what you've got and what skills you have and then externally what do people actually want from you um and the first first two that we worked with for the social scripts they were at a school with another workmate in the office so it was that workmate knowing people at the school and then we were able to get that advice there so i think just start with with who's around you or what your visitors are requiring from you, what they're asking for. Yeah. That's really good advice. Thank you so much. And I think um, watching out for those people around you that have those connections is so important in a lot of the things that we do, isn't it? We talk to our curators about their specialist knowledge, but talking to our friend three desks over who might have an autistic child in the school or or any other needs they're aware of that can be really really useful so um big shout out to everybody making connections with their colleagues across the organization make sure that you as educators um you know connect with everybody else around and um draw them into your circles and your conversations um there is um a comment from mel a lot of museums are not as well resourced as auckland museum i suspect the sensory map and or social scripts are a fairly accessible starting point with a big impact on the target groups would you agree with that it's you said you did a diy approach you know a map and a highlighter <laughs> can't go yeah. any lo more low cost than that absolutely um yeah we at the museum are very numbers driven mm -hmm. uh, um, my i spoke to my manager yesterday about you know the, the journey and he 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 just says we you need to spend time on this because i know for a smaller museum you might not be as well resourced but it, um like it's really well worth the time um into it it makes I would, a difference i would say for me the social script was the easier of the two because the gallery changing and the linking in with other teams um so it's not us that my highlighted version didn't make it up onto the website and um, it was the marketing team so that communication takes time and 
yeah so the social scripts seem to have the bigger impact um for me yeah that's really good to know thank you for that marissa just had a good question um is your whole education and public program team trained at delivering to your accessibility groups or is there specific people that deliver these programs we're all expected to deliver them all and there's no um training plan for when somebody's onboarded so it really is like it, it could be better um but at the moment it's down to um the people like me who have been there for over five years to you know lead by example mm. at the stage yeah and it is um i suppose a good idea to have that across the team because we want to be inclusive and if mm. we then make it an exclusive job of one educator you are the accessibility specialist what does that tell us about us being inclusive to everybody when we're not inclusive across our team or how we're delivering that so um, I suppose people will come to you with specific questions. Is that is that how it works? Are you talking about teachers? Uh, no, I mean your colleagues, you know, if somebody has a group come in, will they come, Tom, help me? Um, yes, yes and no, it's a bit of a conversation, yeah. But yeah, it, it could definitely be better. That's just an inside scoop. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, if you are making any changes or any further leaps and bounds, please do make sure you let us know because all of us are really interested in upping the game at our own institutions. So it's really cool. Do this Absolutely. just put um, some a link up for the Autism Friendly Museum from Museums Victoria. Thank you, Judith. And uh, Judith will be presenting a few weeks down the track. Um, as Mira has managed, uh, we will have a webinar that's specifically uh, looking at audio descriptions and uh, facilitating visits for uh, learners with low vision and blind learners. Um, Helen also um, put a good question up, which you might actually take to Facebook. Um, if you don't mind, Helen, you know, how many other places have access and inclusion policies? That would be really cool to know. I don't know if um, it, it is uh, something that just big prices have or um, small places as well. So um, Elaine just says my cut was working on this now. So excellent timing. Awesome. Glad we could meet that. Is there any other questions that I have overlooked? Helen, you've been really good at um, going through the chat as well. Is there anything you see that I have forgot to ask? Little shake of the head. Well, um, I would like to thank you um, so much. Um, for your awesome presentation and for your um, ability to answer those questions, <laughs> you know, off the cuff. It's been really amazing and um, all the best to your future endeavors um, to both of you. And no doubt we will hear more great things from you very soon. Um, we will um, have more webinars, of course, going forward. And uh, Mel, if you don't mind putting the slides back up, We've got the lovely Tali actually in the webinar today. Tali will be running um, our next webinar on the ninth, uh, presenting at the next webinar on the 19th of May, same place, same time as usual. Um, she will share practical tips, techniques, and resources for teaching outdoors in a webinar that she's uh, co developed with Tash Kingsford, Kingsford from the Department of Conversa Conservation. I'm sorry. Um, unfortunately, um, Tash can't make the session as we had previously advertised, but we hope she will be able to join us at another time. Now, um, Tali's session will be a great opportunity for all of us to learn more about teaching outdoors and make the most of the beautiful environment we have and keep COVID infections low, we hope. Well, thank you again um, to all of you for joining us today. Um, thanks to our amazing presenters. And if you would like to revisit this webinar, the recording will be on YouTube in a few days and on our website as well. Um, all that's left for me to do is to finish us with Karakia. Ono here, ono here. Ono here, kite uru tapunui. Kia watia, kia mama, te ngakau, te tinana, te wairoe i te ara takata. Kaiara i rongo, whakairia ake ki runga. Kia tina, tina, uie, tai ki. Kia ora, thank you so much again for, um, to everybody for attending this webinar and we look forward to hearing more from you in the near future. If you have a request for a topic you want to have covered 
or if you would like to present something, uh, please get in touch with Mel and we look forward to um, having you share in the future. Thanks so much.